You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Common Descent Podcast. This is episode 181, the last episode of 2023. Ooh, yep. Very exciting. We're going to wrap it up uh, with a fun one. This episode's topic is dragonflies. That is a fun one. It's awesome. This is my favorite group of insects. I think they are so cool. I think they're even cooler now, having prepped for this episode. (laughs) We will be talking about dragonflies, their whole extended family which means dragonflies and damselflies, the whole odonate lineage, plus their ancient relatives. We'll talk about what makes this group of insects distinctive, what makes them the way that they are, what are some of the exciting adaptations and lifestyles that they exhibit, and then we will go into the past to talk about some of the coolest and most successful insects in Earth history. Yes. Very fun group. I'm very excited. Uh, Hopefully you're all excited too. If not, you're in for two hours of of uninteresting stuff. (laughs) Which is impossible because it's dragonflies. This episode topic was also requested uh, several times. Dragonflies and their kin was a request from Ligus, Lassie, Big Boss Man, Simon, Jackie, Danielle, Tater Boy, and The Ancient. Good choice, everyone. Thank you to everybody who requested this We don't talk about insects all that much. Well, we talk about insects a lot on the podcast, but they don't often get their own episode, episode 99 and episode 149. And now this one, episode 181. I'm very excited to get into this discussion. But before we do a couple of announcements, we have a Patreon. Yes. Our support that we receive from our patrons allows us to do all of the podcast stuff that we do. All of our science education efforts are supported by those followers we have on Patreon. In return, patrons get all sorts of fun goodies. They get access to live streams and bonus content, things like that. We recently added some new patron tiers with new benefits and such. One of the rewards you can get as a patron is your name shouted out on the podcast at certain levels. This episode, we would like to welcome to the Patreon, Michael and Brad the Scientist. Thank you so much for your support and welcome. Speaking of Patreon, we are coming up on the end of announcing that we're doing a patron giveaway. Over the summer, we reached a milestone of 500 supporters on Patreon. In January, we will be doing a giveaway. We will be randomly selecting some patrons to receive prizes. They can get our new t-shirt, our exclusive Patreon t-shirt, as well as just all the goodies. Top, Top prizes all the goodies. Very exciting. In order to be in the drawing for this giveaway, all you have to do is be an active contributing patron by the end of December, and your name will be on the list. So if you're not that, go ahead and be it. And if you are that, don't go anywhere (laughs) until uh, after the new year. We will be announcing those winners on our anniversary live stream. We are going to be celebrating seven years with a public live stream. Anybody can attend and ask us questions and engage with us which we will be holding on January 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Before that happens, at the very end of the year, we're going to release our end-of-the-year Q&A. Yeah. Which is going to be several hours of us answering questions that were submitted to us by our listeners. Always a ton of fun. And uh, for those of you that really like the sound of our voices, it is just a whole lot of that. (laughs) As much as we could give in one go. (laughs) Also, we recently received some mail, uh, a couple of lovely drinking vessels. Yeah, like tumbler type things. From Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Yeah, mine's all Everglades-y, and it is fantastic. (laughs) If you would like to send us uh, mail, uh, you can find information about how to get in contact with us down in the episode description. Yeah. And as with all of our episodes, we move on now from the announcements to the news. Every episode, we pick some recent news from paleontological sciences or sciences that are related and interesting to us and hopefully interesting to you as well. Keeps everybody up to date. Will, what you got? Well, I thought since we are doing an episode about awesome predators, some news about awesome predators would be fitting. So crocodiles. Mm, Okay. Crocodiles. All right. Just sneaking one last one in. Crocodiles. Just under the wire. This research was looking at the 
evolutionary patterns within the more overall crocodile and crocodile cousin group and the patterns of speciation and extinction in relation to habitat and climate. All right. This is research by Alexander Payne et al. in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. And the article is by Laura Bysus in Popular Science. That will be linked in the blog post. So today, crocodilians, which are crocs, alligators, caimans, and the gharials, are roughly 24 species with potentially a couple of subspecies in there. But pseudosuchians, which is the larger portion of archosaurs that includes crocs and their many extinct lineages and cousins, numbers more than 700 species. And goes back over 250 million years with a lot wider diversity in the ecosystems and morphologies that we see. And just a quick note for anyone who decides to click the link for the news article. They did put in that crocodiles were the only living archosaurs and them and birds are that. And they said archosaurs were in Sudasukia. So they got a couple little errors in there. That term got flipped. I wonder if they'll be fixed by the time this comes out. So if it's fixed, (laughs) awesome. But... I didn't want anyone to be getting the, since taxonomic terms can be so easy to get, I get confused very easily. So I want to make sure. Even this uh, seasoned science reporting site uh, had made made some mistakes. So just didn't want anyone to be confused if you took a look. They wanted to take a look at the evolutionary and extinction patterns across this group. So they made a time calibrated tree. So they were basically making a phylogenetic tree to you know, place the the relationships, but it's time calibrated. So it's taking into consideration the ages of each of those groups. And they included over 500 species in this tree. So a massive study. A massive comparison of the features of these ancient croc cousins to construct an evolutionary history. Exactly. They mapped in this tree how many species were showing up and going extinct in different times. So they were looking for those patterns. You know, once they had the tree, they were then saying, all right, this lineage ends here. So we got an extinction. This one shows up here. So we've got a new spe- a speciation. An origination. So how many species are showing up and disappearing? And where do we see those trends? You know, where do we see those peaks and dips, I guess you could call them. And then they combined that with climate data from the past and synced it up with that timeline to see where do we see these events sync up and what events seem to cause either species to appear or disappear. They were particularly interested in temperature and sea level. Mm -hmm. Those are the two major things that they were looking at. And they found that climate change indeed had an effect, but also seemingly competition had a strong indicator on these trends. And they found patterns in freshwater, sea, and land crocs throughout this with different things happening with depending on where they were living during times where global temperatures increased the number of species tend to go up in sea dwelling and land dwelling crocs Hmm. but wasn't noticed as particularly in freshwater they didn't seem to really be affected by temperature change and they noted that speciation was correlated with this but not extinction they didn't see a similar pattern with extinction when temperature like went down it sounded like Only speciation was following that. When sea levels went up, this seemed to provide the greatest risk of extinction for non-marine crocs. So land-based and freshwater crocs were experienced the highest levels of extinction whenever sea levels went up. And they found indications that competition could have been playing a a big role by calculating estimates for the number of species present at a time Mm -hmm. and how it synced up with extinction and speciation. In non-marine crocs, times of low diversity matched up with times of increased speciation, with more species showing up potentially for niche filling, them filling roles that are now empty because there's less, while increased competition was noted for higher extinction rates, which is expected, but they noted especially in marine habitats. Interesting. And that that potentially could also be due to other marine predators like sharks and mosasaurs and other marine reptiles. And that that, dro- that that competition in marine habitats also synced up with speciation. So that it seemed to be syncing with both. This is notable because they found that what they call decoupling, disconnecting speciation and extinction, that those were not two sides of one coin. 
right? They're not always happening at the same time or for the same reasons. <laughs> yeah, that they're not always just happening for the opposite reason the other happens. Mm-hmm. They were two separate factors. So you really had to consider them individually. And it revealed a more complex picture of their evolution because often it was easy to assume that whatever caused species to show up, the opposite would cause species to go extinct. Right. And that wasn't happening. One of the big things that they're hoping that this will be useful for is the fact that we have a lot of endangered species today and there's climate change happening today. And this might give us insights into what factors might actually be putting different species in more danger Mm -hmm. of extinction, which are the ones that are actually syncing up specifically with extinction. Yeah, it's always hard to identify long-term major trends in the fossil record because, of course, our, our evidence is limited. But these results are a really good reminder that it can be easy, like you said, to assume speciation and extinction are happening for very similar reasons. Mm-hmm. It can also be easy to assume that what is what causes extinction is the same across different habitats yes. or across different time periods. And it's always good to keep in mind that when we're trying to understand the trends we see in groups of ancient life or even modern life, we have to consider where they are and when it is and what lineage it is. You're going to have all sorts of different scenarios interacting in different ways. Yeah. In this one, each combination of land, sea, and freshwater and extinction and speciation and climate and temperature and sea level all were different combinations. Yeah. So it neither one just gave you the answer for what the next one would be. Yes. Uh, always a good thing to keep in mind is because it's very easy in paleontology and often it becomes very catchy mm-hmm. to point at one thing and say, well, yes, that was the reason for all of X, Y, Z. Yes. And often we have to consider the nuances and complications. Well, like the high temperatures stood out to me because we mm-hmm. say that all the time with reptiles. Higher temperatures, better for yes. reptiles. Freshwater didn't care. Right. So not not a universal. Well, I happen to also have a study about awesome predators, although this one is specifically about the predation that they were doing. Ooh. Uh, this is about what tyrannosaurs were eating. Cool. This is research by Francois Therrien et al. in the journal Science Advances, and in the blog post we will link to an article in Gizmodo by Isaac Schultz. Now... We know a lot about what Tyrannosaurs ate. Uh, Tyrannosaurs, of course, Tyrannosaurus and its various cousins, the large theropods of especially northern continents at the end of the Cretaceous. Tyrannosaurs fed on large herbivorous dinosaurs. Yep. We know this because, number one, it makes sense, but also we do have direct evidence of this. We have feeding traces. There are many examples of feeding traces from tyrannosaur jaws and teeth on various species of large dinosaur herbivores. However, all of that good evidence tends to come from adult tyrannosaurs. Ooh, good point. We don't have a lot of information about young tyrannosaurs, and this is a valuable thing to know because, as we've discussed before, not unlike certain crocodilians, it is hypothesized that tyrannosaurs may have changed their feeding habits as they got older that they may have started out as relatively small, really important predators and grew into medium-sized, really important predators and then grew into very enormous, really important predators. Yep. And were they changing their diets along the way? This study reports on evidence of diet in a juvenile tyrannosaur from gut contents. Which it's hard to get better than that. I believe this is the first known example of gut contents in a tyrannosaur. Huh. Which is incredible. That's very surprising to me. The particular tyrannosaur in question is a Gorgosaurus. It is a juvenile, not fully grown. This comes from the dinosaur park formation of Alberta. Based on the measurements of the skeleton... The researchers report estimating that this dinosaur was probably about 750 pounds or 335 kilograms or so, which is a decent size, but a little more than 10% adult body mass in these dinosaurs. (laughs) Ridiculous. Uh, Histology suggests this animal was uh, between five to seven years old. So this was a large animal. Uh, It had been around for a little bit, but it was nowhere near full adult size. That, which is just terrifying. Yes. That, that is such an intimidating size of animal to be a, a very young individual. <laughs> Inside the skeleton, 
our gut contents, including the bones of other dinosaurs. hey Not just like bits and pieces of bone. Inside this juvenile Gorgosaurus, the authors report two sets of articulated hind limbs. Whoa! So both back legs, two pairs of back legs, still mostly together in back leg position. <laughs> These belong to dinosaurs called Cydipes, uh, which are uh, relatives of Oviraptorids. Uh, they're, they're within the Oviraptorosaurs. Based on the bones in there, the authors estimate that these would have been young individuals with estimated body mass of 25 pounds, <laughs> sorry, 10 kilograms, so quite small. Yes. The limbs are largely complete. Articulated means that like the they're still connected at the knee, more or less, at the wrist. They're still in the position of legs. And there are no other notable body parts of these animals preserved within the gut contents here. Ooh. Which suggests altogether that this Gorgosaurus swallowed whole just the back legs. Yeah. Selectively bit off the back legs and swallowed them whole. Huh. Very interesting. The two pairs of legs also are not preserved quite the same. One of the pairs is broken down and acid etched more than the other one which suggests that these were probably two separate feeding events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That this wasn't just it happened to come across some legs. This was something it did at least twice. Yes. That seemingly selectively eating the hind legs off of this species of prey. Okay. This is really interesting because it suggests some type of specialization. Mm -hmm. This animal was eating in a very particular way. These appear to be two feeding events. The prey, in both cases, is the same species, the same body part, roughly the same age. It looks like this animal might have been going after young members of this species and then biting their legs off. Weird. Which is a very particular habit that we don't have evidence of necessarily in the adult tyrannosaurs. And, like, going after a choice piece of the prey is not uncommon in predators. No, there are a lot of predators today that will go after particular parts yeah. of the body. Like, the famous and one of the more morbid ones is, like, killer whales will often just eat the tongue of a lot of the whales they go after. Because it is the densest, most easily accessible piece of of meat in the, the whale. And when we see feeding traces on uh, modern or fossil bones... We often see that they are concentrated in areas where there was a lot of muscle, yeah. like the the thigh muscle or things like that, where there'd be a lot of meat. And that's exactly like drumsticks are a the, very ideal. Literally two pairs of drumsticks. Yes. <laughs> so this does seem to suggest some sort of potential specialization in feeding for younger tyrannosaurs, which could lend support to the idea that they had different dietary preferences as they aged. Uh, on the way towards adulthood. Yeah. It makes you wonder, like, were you leaving the rest of the body for a particular reason? Like, was it to save time? You know, that you just eat the best part and then leave? Yeah, they actually, they did make a note. Uh, somewhere in there, they commented that the fact that it was not swallowing all of the prey whole might mean that they couldn't. Yes. That maybe they their throat wasn't wide enough or something to get the whole prey down. Uh, maybe it was just you bite it and then move yeah because there's uh, you live in a place with tyrannosaurs yeah or did you eat the rest of it normally but those two pieces are small enough and detachable enough that it's just more efficient to swallow those and then you can pull the meat off of other parts mm. you know so you'd find them eating a legless body you know right. if you came across them because they already swallowed the back legs but now they're chewing on the rest of it you know but we don't they weren't swallowing any of those bones yeah so a very interesting thing to find. Weird. Yeah, and who knows? Maybe this was a weird individual <laughs> that just had a thing for hind limbs. Terry, why do you keep doing that? Why do you keep just leaving half of a body laying Stop around? Stop playing with your food. That's weird. <laughs> very cool. Well, uh, tyrannosaurs are famous for having big heads with big jaws. Right. And another group that's famous with having big heads and big jaws are elephants. Past elephants that had very long lower jaws, this study is finding a trend with the evolution of those and the evolution of the trunk. 
All right. Yeah. I thought we were going back to Crocs no, for a second. No. I, kinda, I, was all right. I wanted to throw a curveball. <laughs> This is a study on the evolution of trunks based off of elongated lower jaws. Oh, interesting. This is researched by Chun Shao Li et al. in eLife. It is a preprint. And the article we'll be linking to is by Jacqueline Kwan in Live Science. So elephants are famous for their trunk, which is a very extreme feature. Yeah, it is a and like there's other trunked animals. Tapers have trunks, and there's others with mobile upper lips, mm -hmm. but none of them even really come close to an elephant's trunk. The elephant has a whole extra limb, and we don't even have a lot of other fossil organisms that we even have s speculated having this extreme. So it's a very unusual piece of anatomy that we question the evolution of, and it's difficult to study because it's all soft tissue. It's all skin and muscle, so we don't typically have any direct evidence of it unless we get, like, frozen individuals. So we only have the facial structure. So this research was trying to look at the, di the different facial structure of ancient elephants and get an idea of what the pattern might have been. In the past, there were a number of elephant groups that had elongated lower jaws. Their bottom jaw jutted out Kind of their chin, but it was often the front pair of teeth. Right. Would come out on this expanded section of jaw and then typically have like two tusks sticking out of the lower jaw. Yes. The mastodon at the gray fossil site is an example of that. It's yes. a long chin and then a pair of chin tusks. There's uh, This group is often called gompatheres. Like, and, uh, and there are also gompatheres, yeah. which yes. also had long jaws with uh, chin tusks. There's a whole bunch of different groups that get grouped within gompatheres that have this, and they were looking at three different groups of those. Mm. Gompatheres and amabelodons and, and coralophodontids. Mm. Each of these have those expanded, those elongated jaws. They are all anc ancestrally related to modern elephants and are useful for this study because they do show different features of their lower jaws. So they give different versions of that elongated jaw. And it sounds like most of the ones they look like are are from northern China. They looked at the morphology of the jaw to try to interpret the feeding strategies that would have been most useful, based both off of the shape of the jaw and the habitats they were in. And they did this by partially analyzing the tooth enamel and looking at clues of the wear pattern and what feeding habits seem to fit what they what the teeth show. And they found a different pattern in each one. The coralophodons seemed like they likely lived in relatively closed forested habitats. The embelodons were likely had it moved into more open habitats like grasslands. And the Gompatheriidae they looked at uh, were likely somewhere in between those two. They then combined this with mathematical simulations of the jaw's motion mm. for how would it be moving and interacting with vegetation. The Coralophodons lived in dense forests with lots of plants branching out you know, horizontally, branches of trees, so to speak. Their jaws seem to be suited for exerting pressure in an up-down direction. Okay. As compared to, like, forward and backward. And that they said this could be efficient for cutting through that horizontal mm -hmm. foliage and moving it out of the way, which to them suggested that, that their trunks probably were less developed, that they wouldn't need long, dexterous trunks for manipulating that kind of stuff. Hmm as compared to the other two groups, which were in more open or partially more open habitats, and their jaws were better at cutting the vertically growing plants, the grass that came up. The nasal area also seemed to be to more resemble today's elephants, suggesting a more developed trunk. And if they are eating grass, that is a thing that would be useful for having a trunk to pick it up, which we see elephants today do. And so their jaw seemed to be better at cutting that grass so it matches with where they seem to have been living and, w along with facial features, supports a more mobile trunk. Now, I did not read the full paper to see if there were other things that gave them the clues as to mm -hmm. these trunk adaptations. But this led them to the idea that what may have happened is that elephants were in more closed environments, started developing these longer jaws, were using them one way in the closed environment, started using them differently in more open environments that supported the use of a trunk. And then their feeding habits shifted to relying more and more on the trunk. And the jaw 
receded. And then what we ended up with was short-jawed elephants like today with long trunks. That is hmm. their main feeding tool. And that it could be this interplay of, of lower jaw that led us to these long trunks reaching past that lower jaw and helping them feed. That's interesting. It's interesting to try to decipher the evolution of this. It's a very diverse group of elephants. And of course, gonfathiers are a different lineage than our modern day elephants. Yes. So trying to sort out what did trunks look like? Have they come and gone? Have we seen convergent trends in different trunk patterns? Is a really fascinating and difficult thing to investigate. Mm -hmm. It's extra puzzling because trunks are so important for elephants today yes. that that's such an a major part of their behavior and lifestyle that missing that for ancient elephants is really where we're missing a big component of how they were interacting with their environment. And I saw them describe basically the difference between simple and what they called smart trunks mm. of like earlier elephants may have had trunks, but not as sophisticated, not as dexterous, right. not as mobile as later on trunks. And that you could have seen a shift in that regard to how the trunk functioned interesting i'd also wonder if we've gotten if there were species in the past that had longer or shorter or more complex or simple if we've ever if there's been reduction of trunks oh yeah absolutely did you start out in some areas with complex trunks and then some groups reduced it and mm -hmm. didn't need it as much what a bunch of interesting questions that i don't know how we will find answers to nope very cool well speaking of animals with proboscises I've got news about mosquitoes. Less, that's much less endearing. Wonderful proboscis. Everybody <laughs> loves a good proboscis. This is research by Danny Azar et al. in Current Biology, and we will link to an article in Cosmos by Petra Stock. Mosquitoes are a very familiar group of insects. Their fossil record isn't the best. The molecular studies of mosquitoes estimating their origins puts them back at originating probably somewhere in the Jurassic, but the fossil record only goes back to the late Cretaceous, which means the early record of mosquitoes is not very complete. We're missing a lot of information about the origins of these groups, which, of course, we are always interested in finding more information about the origins of groups. Mosquitoes, in particular, are a very sort of personally interesting group because we have a very dramatic relationship with mosquitoes, us, and other uh, organisms. Yup, yup. Uh, not a great relationship. No, not often. one that we asked for. We're not <laughs> always happy about it. This study fills in that early gap in the fossil record a bit, reporting two mosquitoes from Lebanese amber from the early Cretaceous. Nice. So pushing back our fossil record of mosquitoes quite a bit. These two mosquitoes are identified as both being the same genus and species, which is a new genus and species, Libinoculex intermedius. They are also identified within a new extinct subfamily. Oh, wow. Libinoculicinae. These are the oldest known fossil mosquitoes. Back to the early Cretaceous, uh, putting them into a phylogenetic analysis comparing with other known lineages also suggests that this is the earliest known, the earliest branch mm -hmm. of the mosquito lineage that we now know of, which gives us a new species of mosquitoes much closer to the origins of this group in both time and sort of evolutionary path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Even more interesting, both of the mosquitoes are males. Okay. Which I assume can be told by a number of different features. Insects are often identified by their genitalia. That's yep. my guess is that they looked at genitals, but I, there's probably a bunch of other features. They are both males, their mouth parts exhibit both piercing parts and strong biting mandibles. Weird. Which is a combination we see in modern day female mosquitoes. Weird. Which are bloodsuckers. Yeah. So modern day mosquitoes are famous for uh, eating blood, for being sanguivorous or hematophagous, but only females do that. Yes. F uh, mosquitoes generally feed on nectar and sap plant fluids females feed on blood in particular to help gather the nutrients for reproduction for mating things like that yes males don't 
these two male mosquitoes from the early Cretaceous have mouth parts that seem to suggest they were bloodsuckers. Huh. This is really interesting. Apparently, not totally unprecedented. Okay. Uh, there are a number of fly species that show a similar sort of difference uh, among their members. There are some modern day fly species that have blood sucking males. And they noted in the paper there have been some rare cases reported of male mosquitoes sucking blood, apparently, and it appears to be toxic to them. Weird. <laughs> They're not supposed to do it. Oh, wow. But apparently it happens every now and then. Huh. So it's not unheard of for members of the flies. Mosquitoes are part of the, the overall fly lineage. Or even for male mosquitoes to go after blood sometimes. Mm -hmm. But this is a really interesting case of male mosquitoes being hematophagous back in the early Cretaceous. This is interesting because it complicates the evolutionary picture of this adaptation. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to imagine a scenario where mosquitoes are just plant feeding insects. Yep. Ancestrally, like tons of insects. And then at a certain point, the adaptation develops within females for supplementing their diet with blood of vertebrates. Precisely. This seems to suggest that is not exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. That it could have been all mosquitoes were doing it at some point. It could have been different in different lineages. Is this something that used to be common and then the males lost that ability? Yeah. Is it something that has appeared multiple times? Yeah, did these males develop it? Yeah. Also, why were they feeding? It Was it just all the mosquitoes fed on blood? Mm -hmm. Was it also helping them with something like mating or something like that? Yeah. Was this in all, like, did all mosquitoes start out as blood drinkers and it was just what they drank? Mm -hmm. And then it became a specialized reproduction thing in later mosquitoes? Or were you all doing it? as a specific time yeah there's a lot of scenarios this could indicate yeah this is a very cool study because not only does it add a new species and pushes back the or the earliest fossil record of mosquitoes by some tens of millions of years it also takes the very simple situation and, and familiar situation we have with modern mosquitoes and uh, ruins it yep yeah and says well that's apparently not the case in this particular extinct species. Well, and it's always weird when this happens, because you know, every now and then we'll find a, a, an, extinct, a, an extinct member of a group that is doing something weird, but they'll be like solidly in the middle of the group. And it's like, all right, yeah, yeah. You seem like you've developed this because you also existed at the same time as a bunch of these others that are doing what we expect. Right. You're a weird offshoot. Yes. When it happens with a very early member, it's now much more suspect of... Are you a weird offshoot? Are you a weird offshoot that branched off early on? Or are you weird because that's where... That you kept doing what things started as? Right. Or are modern mosquitoes weird? Are they the weird offshoot? Yes. That then became very successful? Now, I would assume, and I don't know uh, if, this is, if this is the case... I would assume we have other extinct species where we have males and females and this hasn't been noted. Yes. So I, I assume there are ex other extinct species that we have evidence that females and males were doing things differently like modern ones. Mm -hmm. Did that become sort of the unusual specialization at a certain point? Yeah. Huh. Uh, a very cool uh, little study. Weird. Well, while we're on the subject of insects... Uh, it seems like a great, uh, uh, and again, continuing this trend of talking about predatory things. Yeah. After the break, we will move on to our main discussion and start by introducing uh, who the dragonflies are. And then after some overall introductions, we'll go into geeking out about how cool dragonflies are. Yeah. Yeah. One of the papers that I looked at in preparing for this episode began with what I thought was a really interesting and cool point about dragonflies. Mm -hmm. It said, quote, Few insects elicit as positive a human response as dragonflies and damselflies. Along with butterflies, ladybird beetles, and perhaps fireflies, 
Dragonflies and damselflies are generally beloved across cultures. Yeah. That's a really interesting point. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. People love dragonflies. Yep. They're they're just very easily endearing. They're big. They're often colorful. Mm-hmm. They're very distinctive. They're also not pests. Yes. They don't do anything to us. They don't get into crops. They're not even going in houses very much because that's not where a dragonfly is going to do its best work. Mm-hmm. They're not eating our food. They're not biting or yeah, stinging Yeah, they don't bite us. or sting. But they're just really cool people like them. They're also found all over the world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One other paper that I read uh, referred to them kind of tongue-in-cheek as the charismatic megafauna of insects. <laughs> I mean, which yeah. Which is a really cool way to think about them. Yeah, the, the, them and like praying mantises have kind of that... Yeah, that feel of like yeah, you you sort of are the the wolf and tiger of the insect world. <laughs> Dragonflies and damselflies are very familiar insects. Uh, unless you live in Antarctica, you've probably seen uh, dragonflies or damselflies around you. These are very distinctive insects. Mm-hmm. They've got those big compound eyes up front, those big broad wings that we traditionally think of them sticking out to both sides even while the insect is sitting down those long bodies that let all tail like yes sticking out behind them uh we'll go into a bunch more detail on some of their anatomical uniqueties and quirks a little bit later on but first let's talk about what we're talking about this episode dragonflies and damselflies belong to the order odonata odonata I have seen them referred to uh, sometimes as odonates. Yes. I have seen the group. This is something I've come across recently a number of times. I've seen the group called damsel dragonflies. Oh, okay. Damsel dash dragonflies. Yeah. Because it's both. Yes. There are both within here. The order odonata has three subgroups. The main two are anisoptera, dragonflies, and zygoptera, damselflies. Sometimes you'll see the whole group referred to as dragonflies i do that yep uh, we'll probably do that throughout the episode the true dragonflies are anisoptera damselflies are zygoptera these are different generally in a number of ways if you're an insect fan you may already be familiar with some of these dragonflies tend to be more robust while damselflies tend to be slenderer and just light more lightly built dragonfly eyes tend to come very close together while damselfly eyes tend to be more spread apart And very famously, at least this is the first thing that I always think of. This is the distinct thing in my brain. Dragonfly wings stick out to the sides at rest when they're not using them. Whereas damselflies, the wings sweep back along the length of the body when at rest. Yeah, they can fold them back behind them. It's Dragonfly wings have always stood out to me because they don't fold up, which is a lot of other insects that's... A characteristic thing about yeah. their wings. Most winged insects can fold them right up against the body. Yes. Uh, and dragonflies and damselflies can't do that. Damselflies move the wings alongside the body. Dragonflies just leave them sticking out to the sides. Yes. Which seems like a very vulnerable thing to do. Right? I've always thought of the difference between these two groups. And this is a very silly comparison, but it's what my brain has always done. Because they always get compared to helicopters, and we'll talk about that, sure. I'm sure, later on, and how their flight is so cool. <laughs> But that dragonflies are like attack helicopters, like more heavily built, you know, a bit more robust. And then damselflies are like the news helicopters (laughs) with like the the spindly, you know, just mostly the metal frame back end and the big window up front. That you got the compact, you know, a smaller version that the propellers can fold up. (laughs) Yeah. And then you have (laughs) this big robust one. Yes. And of course, there's tons of variety within both of these groups. But those are generally the distinguishing features. Each of these two groups has about 3,000 living species that have been identified. Ridiculous. They are found all over the world. They are extremely widespread in a whole bunch of different habitats. There is a third group. Dragonflies are Anisoptera. Damselflies are Zygoptera. There is a third group, Anisozygoptera, which are closely related to true dragonflies. Mm-hmm. This group includes a single genus, Epiophlebia, with around three, two, or three, or four living species, depending on which analysis you're looking at. That's the entire group. It is 
classified outside of true dragonflies and damselflies. They are described generally as having being similar to dragonflies, but with wings more like damselflies. Oh, okay. They're kind of their own thing. A single genus, a handful of species. This is the last time I'll be mentioning them for this episode. All right. Interesting. (laughs) But there are three subgroups within the order. Huh. I did not know about that third one. Uh, They all live in Asia. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. The dragonfly order, Odonata, is also classified as part of a group of insects called Peleoptera. Insects, very broadly, can be categorized into three groups based on their wings. Mm Mm-hmm. There are wingless ones, like silverfish and springtails, which do not have wings. Most winged insects are in a group called Neoptera, and one of the defining features of those is that the wings fold down against the body. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is how things like beetles and cockroaches can actually fold their wings away under their wing covers. But even stuff like bees and flies, the wings generally fold Right up against the abdomen. Yeah, even though the wings aren't doing the folding action that a beetle wing, like the individual wing, Mm -hmm. doesn't fold up like origami, like it does with a beetle, but they still can tuck them in like a cape right next to the body. There are a few groups of insects that have wings that are not within that group. They are called Paleoptera or Paleopterous insects. These are Odonata, Mm -hmm. our dragonflies and damselflies, Ephemeroptera, which are mayflies. Yep, yep. And there's also extinct groups. There's a famous extinct group called Paleodictyoptera, which are these beaked insects from the Paleozoic, which are also an early group that doesn't have that full wing folding capacity. This puts odonates, our dragonfly group, outside of most winged insects. They are a early branching group, and they ha- they retain this earlier form of the wing structure. And that's why dragonflies can't fold their wings back, and even damselflies that do sweep the wings back aren't folding them quite the same way that we see in a lot of other insects. They're literally folding it the opposite direction of most of those other examples, (laughs) folding them back over them instead of down to the side. Mm -hmm. Dragonflies and damselflies are known among insects for a few exceptional qualities. They are known for being very distinctive in a couple of really dramatic ways. For one, dragonflies are famous for how good they are at flying. Yeah. I they I have seen them described as some of the best flyers in Earth history. Yeah, period. End of sentence. Some of the best things to fly. They can fly at very high speeds for an insect. They can accelerate very quickly. I've seen uh, sighted uh, speeds up to 30 miles an hour. Forward thrust. Which, which like... And that's for something that small. That's so you're, you're, fast. You're a little tiny thing. Like, if you just scaled that down to what you would experience at that size, that's so fast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they are also extremely maneuverable. They're able to change direction very quickly. They're also, this is another very famous thing, they are able to fly in any direction. Yep. They can fly forward. They can fly backwards, mm-hmm. which is a very unusual thing for flying animals to be able to do. They can go up, down, side to side. And they can hover. Yes. And hover, that's another thing that, you know, we take for granted that it's a thing. Most flying animals can't hover in place. Nope. Just float there in one place in the air. Yeah, well, like, you see it in cartoons all the time of birds and bats and so forth, Mm -hmm. you know, flapping and talking to someone. That's why we freak out about hummingbirds, because that's really (laughs) one of the only birds that can do that. Yeah, and dragonflies and damselflies are are a group that is unusual among insects for being able to do that. This is why they get compared to helicopters so often, because they do not move like a plane. They move like a helicopter. It's just up, down, side to side. They float in the air and just kind of move whatever direction they want. It's very very surreal when you really watch one move, because it just feels like they're just being shifted in place and space. Yeah. And just holding their position. (laughs) Uh, Dragonflies and damselflies again, very broadly speaking, are often described as different in this regard. Damselflies generally are considered less adept flyers. Mm -hmm. I've seen them described, uh, at least certain species, as more fluttering. Yes. More like a butterfly. Yes. Sort of a fluttering, uh, less stable movement in the air. Whereas dragonflies are famous for what you were just describing, where they are 
they can basically do whatever they want while in the air. Yeah, when the thing I always think between them is when you see a dragonfly fly, you can't see the flapping happening. Right. But the flaps are a bit more notable in damselflies, like a butterfly. You can see the flaps happening. It's mm-hmm. a little less of that just... Yep. Uh, it has more of a f- <laughs> normal flying feel to it. Yes. <laughs> And we'll go into some more detail on those wings a little bit later on. But for now, suffice it to say, excellent flyers. And as we will get into, they do most of what they do in the air. The other major thing that this group of insects is really known for is that they are incredible predators. Ridiculous. Odonates are, as a rule, carnivorous. They are mainly insectivorous. They are mostly insects that eat other insects. And they hunt on the wing. Yeah. This is another one of those things that doesn't sound as super impressive because there are a bunch of famous examples of animals that do this. But not a lot of animals eat on the wing, catch their food on the wing. And there are a surprisingly few insect groups that do that. Dragonflies are generally, you'll see, described two main hunting strategies. One, uh, which are called hawkers, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are uh, species that patrol around in the air and grab stuff right out of the air. And perchers. Yeah. Uh, Perchers will sit on a branch or a blade of grass or, you know, whatever you're sitting on and then wait for an insect to fly overhead and then swoop up and grab it out of the air. Which, like, both are very cool. But the perchers have always been crazy impressive to me because it's like you're an ambush predator, kind of. That you then have to fly to get to your ambush spot. Yeah. Like, you're so good and quick that you can go from not moving to taking off, flying to the prey, and still catching it before it's gotten... What? You're a living (laughs) anti-air device. Yes, yes, exactly. (laughs) And they're also famous for being really, really good at it. Like, scary effective. Multiple studies have apparently observed dragonflies and damselflies in hunting and found that dragonflies had they have recorded between a 75 percent and 95 percent success rate yep while hunting for comparison like big mammals and predators we're familiar with fail often more than half the time yes it is very hard to be a predator dragonfly if a dragonfly decides it wants to eat you Odds are you're getting eaten by that dragonfly. (laughs) It is insane just how efficient they are at it. And I've seen that there's tons of studies about just how precise and calculated they are in in getting to the prey. They are truly, truly specialized for this, and it's awesome. They they are some of the world's best predators. Yes. And they're aerial predators. Yeah. That's an incredible thing. Now... Dragonflies and damselflies generally are considered to be generalists. They're not very picky in what they eat. Whoever flies by. Whoever flies by, they'll go after it. One instance that I did read about of more specialized behavior, some damselflies are noted for flying but hunting things that are not flying. So oh. Plucking bugs off of leaves and stuff. Ooh. There are certain species, certain large species, which are called helicopter damselflies, <laughs> which are specialized in grabbing spiders out of their webs. Oh, yes. I did. I have heard about those. Yeah. Man, that's so cool. So <laughs> just an incredible group of carnivores. And... The adults aren't the only life stage that are incredible carnivores. The larvae are incredible carnivores. Yep. Dragonflies undergo incomplete metamorphosis. We talked about this back in episode 81. Many insects with metamorphosis, we think about that butterfly version where it's larva, pupa, and then adult. Dragonflies have incomplete metamorphosis. They go from a larva that just goes straight into an adult at a certain point. The larvae, which are called nymphs or naiads, are aquatic predators. Yep. They spend that phase of their life in, usually in freshwater, and they're often some of the most effective and important predators in their little microhabitats. Yep. They eat other insect larvae. They eat tadpoles and small fish. They are very effective. Dragonflies are top predators out of the egg. Yes. All the way through their lifespan. Their whole life 
and in two different environments. <laughs> yes, they go. Yeah, they go from being aquatic predators to being aerial predators. Yeah, a tr- <laughs> truly remarkable group. This is like if barracudas transition into <laughs> being hawks. Yes, <laughs> so cool. Dragonflies and damselflies are also extremely diverse. They are found on every continent except Antarctica. They are most abundant in the tropics. They come in a whole variety of colors. Some of them are metallic colors. A lot of the species are named after their coloration, Mm -hmm. greens and blues. The wings can have cool patterns on them of bands and splotches. Some species have just fully dark wings. Here in Tennessee, I went ahead to get some examples and just looked at what are our local dragonflies. Tennessee dragonflies include such species as green darners, blue dashers, amber wings, jewel wings, fork tails, white tails. Dragonflies and damselflies get really cool names. They do. They're just fun, delightful names. Because they're pretty. Because mm-hmm. we like, because they're big and pretty, and that's how you get humans to like you, is well, be big and pretty. They're very much the intimidating butterflies in a lot of ways. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, they're the attack butterflies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Dragonflies also come in a range of sizes, as we often like to point out. The smallest species of dragonflies and damselflies, and this size is present in both groups, have wingspans of around two centimeters. Oh my goodness! Full wingtip to wingtip, that's less than an inch. They're so small! So tiny. Little itty bitty. Aww, that's very cute. (laughs) On the other side of the spectrum, the largest species, again... Both groups have species that are pretty big. This includes those helicopter damselflies I was talking about. Can have wingspans of around 20 centimeters. Yep. That's eight inches. That's a little more than half of a foot. That's that's a big bug. Yeah. Those That is quite impressive. Uh, the bodies themselves tend to be a little shorter than the wingspan actually does. Yep, yep. So a wingspan of 20 centimeters. Remember that number because we're going to come back to the <laughs> subject of big dragonflies <laughs> later on. So now I'd like to take a little walkthrough of the anatomy of an odonate. They are insects, so they have three body segments, head, thorax, abdomen, just like ants, who we talked about back in episode 149, just like all other insects. The head of a dragonfly contains a few notable features. For one, they're giant compound eyes. Just massive. They take up most of the space of the head in many species. These are compound eyes, so they are they have a bunch of little cells within the eye. We talked about this back in episode 68 about eye evolution. Dragonfly eyes can have up to 28,000 cells within the eyes, which gives them extraordinary vision. Yes. This is why it's so hard to sneak up on them if you've ever tried to catch one. Yeah, they have almost 360 vision. They have very high resolution vision. They have great color vision. They are visual predators. That's what they're using to hunt. They also have three ocelli, which are little, you know, light, dark sensing organs, sort of extra eyes. Mm -hmm. Dragonfly adults tend to have short antennae. Mm -hmm. So many insects have long feelers on top of their head. Dragonflies do not. That's not what they're using to get around. Well, and y- can you picture those just <laughs> in the right. air as they're <laughs> fluttering going around, high speed, and making those turns, whipping them in their giant <laughs> yeah. eyes? It's like a dog's ears out the window. <laughs> Dragonfly and damselfly nymphs tend to have longer antennae for feeling their environment. They also tend to have smaller eyes. Yes. Adult dragonflies. The other significant feature on the head is the mouth parts. Mm-hmm. Very important for a group of predators. Dragonfly mouth parts are pretty standard, straightforward. They are chewing mandibles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, They're mouth parts that go side to side, like you think of your typical chewing mandible. Uh, They are simple, but effective. Yes. Cool looking. Whenever you see an up-close video, it's just these little, like, metallic-looking sides come out to chew things up. Very pleased. Like, I find it very satisfying Mm -hmm. watching them eat something because it's so efficient. (laughs) Dragonfly and damselfly nymphs have highly specialized mouth parts. Less standard. They are very unstandard. <laughs> Their part of the mouth parts, a structure called the labium, is modified into prehensile grasping appendages. Yep. This structure is like a, a single long arm. It is hinged so it can fold and extend. At rest, it folds over the face like a mask. Mm. And I've seen it called a labial mask. 
Yeah. That's that sort cool. of covers the, which makes them look very intimidating. They look like a bandit. Yes. Like they've got a mask over their face. When they relax the muscles that hold it in place, this hinged appendage launches forward. And in some, it is shaped like a spoon. Mm-hmm. In some, it is shaped like forceps. Yep. To grab prey and pull it back towards the mouth. And it's just, it's like a claw machine on their face. <laughs> yeah, but like a lightning fast claw yes. machine. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, you know, those, uh, um, those grabbers that you can like, uh, like the pull. ones you, you get at museum gift shops yeah, and yeah. stuff. And there's those ones that have the, the like accordion part that will oh, yeah, 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 yeah. push them out. And it's kind of like those where yes. it is, goes out real fast and then comes back real fast. To just grab things with a snake strike kind of motion. Yes, this is a specialized structure that we see. So it's not just the adults that are highly effective specialized predators. Also, the larvae are highly specialized predators, in this case for aquatic prey. And they're hunting with alien mouths. Like, yes. It's it's an alien inner mouth, but on the outside. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite pieces of anatomy on the planet. I think it's so cool. Very, very cool. Hopefully in the blog post, we'll find pictures or video or something to share. So the head of the dragonfly, that's the business end. The second section is the thorax, which, as with most insects, is about locomotion. Mm -hmm. The thorax has three pairs of legs attached to it because these are insects. They have six legs. Hexapods. Odonate legs are large and powerful. They are (laughs) strong, long legs. They tend to have long spines on them, especially the lower sections, which are really great for grabbing at stuff. Yeah. They're using their leg. When they're hunting, some th- small things they can just catch in their mouths, which is incredible. But they can also use their legs to grab stuff out of the air. The th- shape of the thorax is angled in such a way that the legs project forward under the head. Mm-hmm. It's like even a better grabbing position. And one up, I think, again... A really cool thing about the specialization of this group, odonate legs are not very good for walking. Yep. Dragonflies don't tend to walk very much. Like So many insects spend so much of their time walking around. Yes. Even like flies and bees, stuff that are very effective flyers, will land and just sort of walk around a bunch. Well, and when they're doing what they're going to do, like if they're going to eat mm-hmm. or, you know, get the pollen or nectar, they land and then they're just fully walking and trucking around yes dragonflies and damselflies for the most part have two modes either sitting still or flying and so they're good as gra- the the legs are good for grabbing prey and as landing gear yes so that they can perch but that's it <laughs> yeah so not only what it's an incredible not they go from being mostly aquatic to being mostly aerial and they mostly don't have a land phase. Yeah. Uh, there are some nymphs that are terrestrial hunters. Okay, I didn't that know that. Do, yeah, there is some diversity there. But generally speaking, odonates just don't spend a lot of time moving around on the ground. Which sounds like one of those things, like we've talked about with snakes, of you got rid of your legs, that's gotta be, that had to be a bad idea. Right. But like, if you just presented it as, did you know dragonflies can't even walk? Yeah, they don't even walk. They, they can barely walk. So yeah, because they don't need to. Nope. That's not what they're here for. It's not necessary. <laughs> Speaking of which, the other feature on the thorax, and the most famous and well-studied feature of dragonflies and damselflies, are their wings. Mm-hmm. Odonates possess two pairs of large, transparent wings with complex veins throughout them. We've talked about this. We talked about this in episode 99, uh, The Evolution of Insects. Insect wings tend to have all sorts of folds and reinforcements in the wing that help them both resist the stresses of flight, but fold and adjust while flying to help stay aerodynamic. Dragonflies... And damselflies, like we said before, dragonfly wings stick out to the side. Damselfly wings fold down along the body. Damselflies also often will have what are called petiolate or stalked wings, where the base of the wing is very narrow. Yes. Uh, You also see this in some other, like wasps Mm -hmm. sometimes will have this. Uh, This varies across species. It's often it's associated with damselflies. Perhaps the most famous thing about dragonfly and damselfly wings in in a way that they differ from most other insects most neopterous insects most flying insects 
have what are called indirect flight muscles. Mm -hmm. The muscles in the thorax, the muscles in the thorax that control the wings, that make the wings flap, don't actually move the wings directly. They distort the shape of the thorax. Yes. And that causes the wings to flap. Yeah, they flex, and then that bends the body wall. Yes. And since the wings are attached to the body, the outside of the body wall, they move. Yeah, so they have muscles that basically vibrate the wall of the body. This allows most insects to flap their wings faster than their nerve impulses could flap the wings. Yes. This is how you get insects that just have this preposterously high flap rate. Yeah. Thus, the buzzing that is so famous with so many flying insects. Odonates have direct flight muscles, which means muscles on the thorax directly maneuver and move the wings themselves. Uh, They're not the only group that does this. I believe mayflies also have this. Also, apparently some cockroaches have this. They have direct flight muscles. This means that dragonflies and damselflies can't flap as fast as a lot of other insects, but they have independent control over each wing yeah they can flap and angle and move each of their four wings independently this gives them an extraordinary amount of control over what they're doing in the air there have been tons of studies that examine the complex flapping patterns of odonates yep 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 the wings also have a number of specialized features to help make their flight more efficient I've seen them described as among the most specialized wings of all insects. Insane. They've got special cells within the wing, special sections that help to reinforce, like struts that go across the wing to help make them stronger. There's a whole bunch of these. I'll mention uh, two of them because they'll come up again later. There's a structure called the notus, which is effectively a small hinge on the front edge of the wing that provides flexibility. And there's also a structure called the pterostigma, which is a group of wing cells near the apex of the wing. So way off at the tip of the wing. These are often dark. They often are colored. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if you look at a dragonfly and you see that dark spot on the very tips of the wings, that's the pterostigma, which is thought to act as sort of a stabilizer for the end of the wing. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the tip of your wing is going to experience a lot of particular forces while flying. This is thought to help either stabilize it or something to that effect so that their wings can maintain flight. Neat. Uh, I saw one paper also pointed out that they might be a visual indicator. Yes. Uh, Not just for other dragonflies, but so that you can see where the tips of your own wings are. Yep. Yep. I was just thinking that. That's very cool. Well, because they're transparent. Yes. They're see-through. So you can actually keep track of what your dimensions are while you're flying. Yeah. Which is a pretty cool thought. They're exceptional. So we talked about how they are exceptionally good flyers. They're very maneuverable. They hunt on the wing. Because of their powerful flight abilities, dragonflies are also one of a short list of insects that migrate. Mm -hmm. There are dragonflies that undergo migrations. There are individual, there are species where individuals are known to migrate hundreds to thousands of miles. Uh, There's one species which are called globe skimmers, which migrate across the Indian Ocean. This species has a worldwide tropical distribution, unsurprisingly. Yep, that makes sense. There are also a number of species that are known to perform multi-generational migrations. Ooh. Where it the full mi- migratory loop will be, you know, 10,000 miles or something, and it is done over the course of three generations of adults or something like that. Huh. That... This group is born over here and then migrates over here and then their offspring grow into adults and then migrate over to there and then their offspring migrate back to the starting point. Weird. Yeah. Which raises all sorts of cool questions about how do you know? One like, what are you following? And what are you following? Very cool. Because most migrations that you hear about and see are seasons it's you're following the winter to summer yeah cold and hot or when the plants are growing or where your prey is going or so that you don't get frozen like Mm -hmm. you're following the seasons but if like if you're doing it multi-generationally and at least a lot of insects also reproduce seasonally Mm -hmm. you know because there's better times to be a, a hungry 
youth and then to lay eggs and so forth. If you are you breeding outside a season? What's the trigger? What are you following? I didn't look very deeply into it. Uh, one of the species that does that does it in North America, like oh. where we live. They they do a, like a loop around North America. Very cool stuff. That oh man, now I want to. I'm know. glad I'm teaching you things about dragon. Yes, that I'm. Whenever. Groups like this, I'm mm-hmm. always like, I, there's a couple things in here that I think I'm going to surprise Will with. Yep, yep. There's another one coming up. <laughs> the last segment of a dragonfly's body is its abdomen. This is another very famous thing about dragonflies. The abdomen is long and flexible. It is like a long tail that sticks out the back. Uh, it is multi-segmented, mm-hmm. as is typical for insects. It has, you know, there's a bunch of organs back there. The most famous part of what's going on in the abdomen for, for odonates are the reproductive structures. Mm-hmm. Dragonflies reproduce weird. Yeah. They do a weird thing. Male dragonflies and damselflies produce sperm down towards the end of the abdomen. And in females, down towards the end is where they accept sperm. And that's where their ovipositor is if they have one. It's where they're laying eggs. Males produce sperm at the very end of the abdomen. But then they have secondary genitalia on a segment further up the abdomen towards the thorax, they move their spermatophore from the back segment to this secondary genitalia further up, and that's where the females will pick it up from. Yes. So when they're copulating, when they're doing the deed, males will find a female, they have claspers way down at the end of the abdomen that they will grasp onto a female either by the head or the thorax, and then... The female curls the abdomen around to contact the underside of the male to pick up the sperm with that abdomen, forming a structure that is called the mating wheel. <laughs> they loop around yep. and two, they come together and then they this loops around to form this wheel. I've also seen it called a copulatory wheel. Fantastic! That I was trying to think. I'm like, what? Sh- what would I? What would we call that shape? Because I was picturing it in my well, head. Wheel is a great name for it. Yeah, some species will do this while perched. Plenty of species do this while flying. Yep, they reproduce. They copulate in the air, which is such an utterly bizarre thing to do. I don't know that there are many animals period that do that yeah we we have plenty that will do their courtship in the air yes lots of birds have flying courtships birds of prey are are famous for doing things like that but when it's time to actually copulate they tend to land yes because of course you yeah of course you land (laughs) why would you make this complicated this is arguably the most important thing evolutionarily speaking you're ever gonna do is passing on genetic material, why would you put it in the sky yeah. where it's just all sorts of things can go wrong? And dragonflies are like, what? It's not like it's hard. Right. <laughs> to stay up in the air as long so as we want. Dragonflies are all members of the meter high club. <laughs> After mating, uh, females will often lay their eggs in or near the water. Uh, when they hatch, the nymphs come out. Again, nymphs tend to be aquatic. The nymph stage of life typically lasts months to years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They can spend years as this aquatic nymph. They metamorphose into adults. The adult stage tends to only last weeks, a couple of weeks to a couple of months for the adult dragonflies. So dragonflies and damselflies tend to live near freshwater. Yes. That most commonly they're living near rivers or lakes or whatever. There are some that are like rainforest dwellers. There are some that live in more coastal habitats, but they tend to be... Uh, tied to fresh water yes and that that's if you think about when you often see them there's usually at least a body of water somewhere yeah. nearby when i think about dragonflies i picture like the picture in my head there is a lake in the background yeah, that they're on the the you know grass or yeah, weeds they're, they're in the reeds <laughs> right next to the the l- lake or pond and yeah because that's where they gotta put their babies and that's where they came from when they metamorphosed <laughs> yes the abdomen of the larvae also specialized not for reproducing because they're larvae they're not ready to reproduce but they have gills Mm -hmm. damselfly nymphs have external gills they have uh, what are called caudal lamellae i think is what they're called they are shaped like fins yep sort of sticking off the back of the abdomen they use them to breathe and to swim 
Which is cool. They use them like fins. Yeah. They swim with them, which is very cool. Dragonfly larvae don't have external gills. Their gills are inside the rectum. Mm-hmm. So they are internal gills. So in order to breathe with them, they have to pump the water in through the abdomen. They have to pump water in and out of their butt. Yep. They are butt breathing. Like it, literal, but like yeah, turtles yeah. have nothing on <laughs> dragonfly larvae. They do it when they absolutely must. Dragonfly larvae, like, I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> uh, apparently there are some dragonfly naiads that are burrowers, like burrow into the sediment, and they'll stick the end of their abdomen up out of the sediment, like a breathing tube. Yeah, yeah, a little snorkel. And then also, are you, I'd say you're yeah. shaking your head like you already know this. I didn't know this. I, I don't I le- think I knew this before. I, if it's what I think is I learned this from a true facts video. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. The process that allows dragonfly larvae to pump water in and out of the rectum to run it over the gills so that they can breathe, they can also use to shoot water out of their butt to propel themselves through the water. Yeah! They have jet propulsion from their butt. These are little jet-propelled aquatic alien-mouthed predators. Yeah! I don't know how much cooler I can make a single sentence. They shoot water (laughs) out of their butt, which propels their little body, because they're little, they're bugs, Mm -hmm. propels their little bodies through the water, where they then shoot their mouth parts forward to grab something. (laughs) Uh, Jim so cool. They are so, so awesome. What a cool group of insects. Yeah, it's, it is, it is definitely a group that, as we've described before, feels like it was designed for a movie or a video game mm-hmm. where it's just like, the, the, the nymphs need something else. The mouth's awesome and they need something else. Right. It's like, what, what if they had a, a jet boost? Like what that, if, perfect. What if the that nice ones perfect. had fins, mm-hmm. but those were the pretty ones that yeah. you make friends with. And then the other ones have uh, jet butts. All right, sweet. We've got the the jet ones for the 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 car and jet and plane enthusiasts, and we got the mermaids. <laughs> Perfect. Right. Yes. We're gonna make a fortune off of We've these. We've got the boys' toy and the girls' <laughs> like, toy. It's just it is. They are so cool all the way around and in different ways. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, that comment, by the way, was a dig at fast food restaurants. Yes, yes, exactly. They used to do that. I don't think they still do that anymore. The boys' toys and the girls' toys. No, I don't think I so. always thought that was weird. Yep, yep. <laughs> it was a very weird thing to do, to gender your Happy Meals. <laughs> Dragonflies and damselflies, highly unique, highly specialized insects all throughout their lifespan. Uh, truly unusual, v- very distinctive among insects. Uh, as I have mentioned before on the podcast, this is probably my favorite group of insects. Mm-hmm. I think dragonflies are so cool. They're just so, they're they're so much fun. They, they are utterly impressive, ridiculously fascinating. And the more you look into them, both of those just increase. Yes. <laughs> like they, they just become more better. impressive and awesome. Speaking of becoming more impressive and awesome... After the break, we shall leave the modern groups of dragonflies for the moment and go into the fossil record and talk about the dragonfly fossil record and some of the really cool dragonflies that used to be. As I mentioned earlier in the discussion, dragonflies and damselflies belong to the insect order Odonata. Odonata belongs to a broader group that are called Odonatoptera. This is, we've talked about, you know, you've got crocodilians and crocodiliforms. This is the same basic concept. Odonatoptera includes the true odonates, dragonflies and damselflies, and then all of their ancient cousins that are on the lineage of dragonflies and damselflies. The fossil record of this lineage and what we're going to about to be talking about is true odonates and these earlier cousins. Yes. This group has a surprisingly good fossil record. There are apparently thousands of known specimens, hundreds of identified extinct species. Wow. They are found all over the world. There are dozens of extinct lineages that have been identified. They have among the most complete fossil record of insects crazy most of these fossils are compression fossils so this is what happens when you get a thing that is pressed between layers of sediment this is how we often find leaves 
when you think of like a leaf, a compression means that it, what's left is this two dimensional carbon film in the shape of the original thing. Very much like pressing flowers in a book, but then long enough that you only have the carbon. <laughs> yes, all that's left is this organic film. Uh, it's not uncommon for insects to be found this way. This is how dragonflies and their kin are commonly found, is as these compression fossils and sediment. They are well represented at some famous sites like Solenhofen, nice. which is the famous Jurassic site in Germany where we get things like Archaeopteryx, the, uh, the Crato Formation in Brazil, which is early Cretaceous. The most common part of these animals that is preserved as fossils are the wings. Yep. Uh, we talked before about how a lot of groups of animals and plants have that one part of the body that just tends to preserve better than everything else. For dragonflies and their cousins, it's the wings. Sometimes they are preserved alongside with heads and bodies, but most of dragonfly paleontology is focused on comparing wings and wing structures, which is convenient that they have extremely complex wings with all sorts of cool features on them. Yeah. Uh, they are very much like mammal teeth. Yes. Like so much of paleontology with mammals is focused on the teeth and the shapes of the cusps and the different tissues and the roots and all that. Dragonflies and such, same thing with all of the things in the wings. As for why they're so well-preserved in the fossil record, I did see some discussion that made a couple of interesting points. For one, they're big. Yes. These are, they, they are often large insects. They have big wings. The wings are very sturdy and robust. They're built that way. They have to be sturdy because they're the thing that's flapping through the air and carrying the bug. These animals also tend to live near freshwater. Yep, yep. And that is a great place to fall in the water and then gradually sink to the bottom and get buried by mud and stuff. Uh, it's not uncommon. I saw it noted. It's not uncommon for dragonfly, etc. wings to be found in life position, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. body is gone. Yep, yep. It's like the wings are where they would be and the body has just been eaten away. Yes, which makes sense. I figure the wing's not the part you want to eat if yeah. you're a scavenger. No, to my understanding that it, insect wings are, you know, once they've dried and, and you know, fully expanded after they, they pupate and metamorphose, it, it's basically now just dry cuticle. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, you know, it's like, like our hair and fingernails where it's like that, that's not doing much anymore. It now just is a static, you know, not static as in unmoving, but like. Right, and there's like there's nerves that yes. feed it and stuff, but there's no like good organs and, exactly. and extensive blood flow and all that kind of stuff. In Those see-through parts are just uh, that cuticle. There's nothing mm -hmm. happening in that area, so that to surface area, there's very little going on. An interesting note about dragonfly fossil record: not very common in amber. Interesting, which is an odd. We think about amber as being great for insects. This group of insects, not super common in amber. Apparently, the main exception that I saw noted is that Burmese amber tends to have lots of dragonflies in it. Huh. For one reason or another, there are hundreds of specimens known from Burmese amber. But broadly speaking, these insects do not tend to occur in amber very commonly. Interesting. I wonder how much that says about... Burmese amber or those dragonflies. Right. Like, are, were you perching differently or something? Were you hanging out on trees? Yeah. Are you small? Or were you just all, like, great small species that were hanging out on sappy trees? Yes, yes. Interesting. The dragonfly fossil record goes all the way back to the Carboniferous period of the Paleozoic era. The earliest known fossils within Odonatoptera are a little bit over 320 million years old. Uh, I've seen records noted in both Argentina and China. They are among the oldest known insects, yep. period. Yep. This is around the very beginning of the insect fossil record. These very first members of the Odonatopteran lineage look a lot like dragonflies. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have basically the same overall shape. Those big, broad wings, the complex veins, the long abdomens, the mm -hmm. bodies that are long and stick out. The, the dragonfly shape took off, so to speak, very early on. The first ones we have found in the fossil record already have that general shape. I saw one quote about them talking about just the, the length of their lineage and was mentioning the fact that, like, you can, you'll see lots of examples of people using, like, dragonfly 
pins or silhouettes or you know just little mock up artificial dragonflies to scare away insects like to keep them off of them <laughs> because insects recognize the shape of a yeah. dragonfly as a predator very often and i saw one quote of just saying like yeah because they've been predating on insects since the beginning and of the, insects. The sharks of the sky yeah so like this is ingrained so deeply <laughs> in the insect genome to fear this shape that well, of course it works. <laughs> it also makes the... You'll all very commonly see dragonfly, the shape of a dragonfly, used in ancient depictions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's like, mm -hmm. how do you, you... know, You'll see, like, a depiction of an ancient forest, and there'll be a dragonfly in it. Yes. Because, yeah, that shape was around all the way back to the earliest forests in the Carboniferous. One of the uh, notable differences within these very earliest Odonatopterans is that they had six wings. What? They had an extra pair of what are called prothoracic winglets. Little, they're not full big old wings. They are little winglets. This is not the only group that has them. The Paleodictyopterans, those beaked Carboniferous uh, insects, also have, they have two big pairs of wings. And then these little extra ones up front. I don't know what those are for. I didn't know there were any six winged insects. Whoa! Yeah, this is an early feature that showed up and then was lost in these groups. Wow. That's and they're li awesome. I don't know if they're like stabilizers yeah, yeah, yeah. or helpful for gliding or something. Yeah, they could be doing something because like uh, flies have turned their second set of wings into these little stabilizer yes. structures. So like maybe it's doing something similar to that. Mm -hmm. I uh, bet we mentioned this in episode 99. Yeah. Uh, and we have since forgotten it. Yep, but that's, that, <laughs> that's so weird. Shortly after these very first ones, starting around 315 million years ago, and again, to put us in context, we are this is the late Paleozoic, the earliest forest. This is around the same time that the first reptiles are showing up. Mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of land vertebrate community at this time. Mostly it's early tetrapods, amphibian-like things. But lots of arthropods, insects and myriapods and stuff like that. Starting around 315 million years ago, Odonatopterans become extremely abundant and diverse. In the late Carboniferous, the Pennsylvanian, there are several lineages known with a wide range of sizes and wing shapes and habits. They are all over the place. There are full, they are, they are filling ecosystems. They are all, most likely, aerial predators. Yeah. In fact, uh, I saw one paper that described that today odonates tend to fall into three main ecological niches. Small species, just small ones that hunt small things, and then the hawkers and the perchers. Yes. And they noted that back in the Carboniferous, all three of those strategies seem to be present, and they have since been present in every geologic period. Yeah. Like, the way to be a dragonfly or a damselfly was established in the late Carboniferous. And that was one of the thoughts I had of like how well good their fossil record is, is like, does that, how much of an indication is that, that they've just been everywhere for a long time. So there's lots of chances for them to fossilize. <laughs> yes. We also have fossils from this time of nymphs, which are also aquatic predators all the way back then. And I also saw reference that at least some of them in the Carboniferous already have that mask, those that specialized set of mouth parts. Excellent. Often in the late Carboniferous, there will be lots of diversity in the same formation, the same outcrop, which suggests that you had ecosystems with many different types of Odonatopterans within them. So this was a, they were forming complex ecosystems with multiple different strategies in the same ecosystem. And then the other point that has to be made here, these were the world's first aerial predators. Yeah. This was it. Mm -hmm. This is the group that got way before pterosaurs or birds or any of them showed up. These were the world's first aerial predators and they remained the only aerial predators, at least the only major, I, don't, I haven't seen reference to other groups that were doing this. This is the only major group of aerial predators for the entire late Paleozoic into the Triassic. Yep. This was it. If it flies and eats you, it's one of these insects. It's really insane to note how successful they are today. You know, talking about how they are ridiculously efficient predators mm -hmm. today 
but that that's how they got their start. Like we can't measure how good they were at catching things back then, but they were being aerial specialized aerial predators. They had a lot of the specializations today that we note that are for predation all the way back at the beginning of their fossil record and that they seem to have been successful Mm -hmm. due to the fact that they were diverse and widespread all the way up to like, that's a level of dominance that few other organisms on the planet can like plants can claim stuff like that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This, this group of insects staked out a position and have just kept it. Yes. For 300 million years. That's unprecedented typically when you look at the fossil record that's really really insane now these early these late carboniferous late paleozoic odonatopterans are missing some of the wing specializations that we see in modern dragonflies certain features aren't present up at the top some features don't show up until a bit later on some researchers there's been some discussion about does this mean something about how they were flying Might they have been less specialized flyers? Might they have been less good flyers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Others have pointed out, what you just pointed out, that clearly they were doing something right. Yes. It would be an absolute mistake to say that they weren't successful. Mm -hmm. So they may have been flying differently from modern species. Or even if they were, you know, quote unquote, less efficient, you know, less effective flyers than today's, they still might have been by and far the best most effective at that time oh yeah well and they and they were yeah like Like, no one else was doing it any better so like even if you (laughs) even if they were hunting other flying insects they still might have outscored those flying insects to the same degree that today's are doing it what i what i meant to say is they were the best flying predators around exactly and yeah that's a really good point you still could have been better flyers than all the other bugs around so you may not have been as good as today's but if today's are also competing with more effective flying prey the gap might be the same, basically. Right. Well, now you're hunting flies. Yes. Which are, we haven't, done a flies, we haven't done a flies episode, but <laughs> really incredible flyers. Yeah, the f- and <laughs> just to backtrack again, the fact that they are that successful with hunting flies. Right. These are a group of organisms that can do a point landing upside down after flying yeah. right side up. And these are the ones that catch them and out of the air. And these catch them... <laughs> At least seventy percent of the time, and I had that thought when we talked about the damselflies that pluck spiders out of their web. How cool! Yes, to be a predator who specializes in hunting one of the world's most impressive groups of predators. Yes, that's like being a seal who specializes in hunting great white sharks. Yes, exactly. (laughs) That's incredible. (laughs) Yeah, you're good at you hunt flies Mm -hmm. that's like it's like you chose the most challenge like craven the hunter give me give me the the hardest thing to do i will take on the spider (laughs) i'm gonna gonna go get it if someone doesn't draw that i'm gonna be so sad please give us fan art of some sort of dragonfly uh craven the hunter oh plucking a a red and blue spider out of its web (laughs) We will call up Aaron Taylor Johnson and we'll see if we can get him to do a voice. I just played the new Spider-Man game and now I'm all craven up. <laughs> craven showed up in one of my X-Men comics Yay! recently. That's great. During the Carboniferous period and the Permian period, so between 315 and 250 million years ago or so, we see a lot of innovations in the wings. Mm-hmm. We see a bunch of familiar stuff start to show up. Multiple groups evolve those stalked wings that we think of often with damselflies. Uh, those are thought potentially to have been good with cluttered environments. Oh, uh, you can okay. kind of fold the wings up. It, it'll let it, you fly in a slightly different way. We see multiple convergent solutions to strengthening the wings. So we see ancient groups that have specialized wing structures that are different from our modern groups. Yeah, it wasn't just a single path to today's advanced wing. There were multiple attempts and, and experimentation yes. evolutionarily with doing different it. Different things, doing the same approach. Yes. The same, different approaches to the same thing. Strengthening those wings, giving them extra flexibility. The notice, which I mentioned earlier, the hinge on the leading edge of the wing, appears to have evolved one time Okay. in the Permian and then took off from there. The pterostigma, which is that group of cells on the tips of the wings that it may be stabilizers, the 
That also appears in the Permian, but there is at least one other group that evolved a similar structure. Interesting. So that has evolved at least two times, that general approach. There is also evidence of the secondary copulatory apparatus by the late Permian. Okay. Like that secondary genitalia where they pass the spermatophore from one place to the other was is there in the late Permian. All so right. So that also seems to be something that showed up very early on. By the end of the Permian, by the time we get to the end of the Paleozoic and we are almost ready for the age of reptiles to begin, most of the features we think of as being odonate features, dragonfly and damselfly features, are present in these ancient odonatopteran groups. We haven't gotten true odonates yet, but a lot of those features are already there. There are several extinct lineages that are present throughout the late Paleozoic. There is one of them that is the famous ones. Yep. There is an extinct family called Meganuridae, also known as Griffinflies. Yeah. These are very diverse. They are known from dozens of species in the Carboniferous and the Permian. They were super successful. They had a range of sizes, a range of habits. They were similar to many modern families. Like They were doing the dragonfly thing back way before dragonflies. They are famous because they also include the largest members of this lineage, mm-hmm. which also happen to be the largest insects of all time. Yep. There are two genera that are cited that, that, that fall into this category. Meganura which is found in the in Europe in the late Carboniferous, and Meganeuropsis from the early Permian of North America. Two different places, two different time periods, two different genera that have both achieved gigantic size. I mentioned before, the largest living species of odonates have wingspans up to 20 centimeters. Which is big. Eight inches. That's big. Meganeura and Meganeuropsis both have full wingspans, and some of these are known from full, the full fossil of the wings, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. up to 70 centimeters, (laughs) which is just shy of 30 inches. That is just under two and a half feet. This is a bug that if I stretched my arm out and it landed on my elbow, its wings would stretch from my fingertips to my shoulder. Yep. That's... That's not a little bit bigger than modern insects. No. That's huge. It's it's That's bigger than most of our modern flying vertebrates. Yes, exactly. Like that is bigger than your <laughs> average bird. Yeah, and bats. Like, yeah, yes. that's bigger than most the like the majority of bats. Absolutely. Now, they wouldn't have been heavier necessarily. Mm-hmm. Like these are they're bugs. Yeah, that, those that wings are made of almost nothing. Mostly wing there <laughs> within a very uh, uh not much of that width is body. <laughs> Yes. The bodies would have been almost that long. Mm-hmm. Uh, like modern, I, I didn't find a length m- measurement for the bodies, but based on the ratios we see in modern dragonflies, these would have still been pretty long bodies. Yes. 70 centimeter wingspans, the largest insects in the fossil record, were aerial predators. Yeah. I have seen them referred to as aerial super predators. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Uh, they were carnivores. We have well enough preserved fossils of this family to know that they had sturdy mandibles with sharp teeth, you know, quote, teeth. Yeah, yeah. They had long legs with big, strong spines on them, just like our modern uh, ones. That angled thorax that thrusts the legs forward under the mandible. Big compound eyes with excellent vision in all sorts of directions. They, uh, They've been pointed at as likely being hawkers Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. flying around grabbing stuff out of the air this is the group that i saw noted that the nymphs have been found with that labial mask (laughs) i didn't find if the nymphs were gigantic yep yep yep. i did i didn't i didn't think to go digging for that when i was taking these maybe i like to think that they were i mean they would have let's assume in the absence of actual information on that that the naiads were also enormous. They'd have to be big enough for the final molt to give rise to that size of adult. Yeah. Because to my knowledge, with the way these kinds of insects grow, the adults won't be getting any bigger once they reach adult stage because they would have to shed their skin to do, and 
these kinds of insects don't shed after that final shed. Right. The yeah, young true. shed multiple times as they grow and get bigger. Dragonflies, uh, from what I read of the life cycle, nymphs will go through, you know, a dozen or so molts as they grow. Yes. And then they grow into a non-reproductive flying adult. Yes. Which then flies around for a bit and then has one more stage, which is the final reproductive adult stage. So, like... They're not, they're not doing much of the growing once they start flying. So the nymph has to be enough mass to fit that much dragonfly inside it Mm -hmm. for that final molt when they leave the water and go to the air. So they would have to be big enough. I don't know how big that actually, I don't know what the (laughs) math and dimensions are from, because insects are magicians in how much they can fold up inside their larval body (laughs) are not beholden to such paltry concepts as mathematics they are bodies of holding (laughs) when they are young you are a a nymph of holding (laughs) yes so like but you have to imagine that thing would have would have been able to bite a toe pretty well (laughs) yeah i would think so these giant odonatopterans uh, are among the groups that don't have all of the features we see in modern dragonfly wings So there's been questions based on their size and their wing shape of how they were flying. I know there's been discussions in the past about were they actually doing more gliding than flying? Yes, because now Uh, you are in a a size category where the physics might be able to let you do different stuff. Right. Uh, It could just be that they were maybe less acrobatic than modern dragonflies. They may have lived in more open habitats. Mm -hmm, That would mm -hmm. make tons of sense because you have, you're huge. Yes, you, you, you need to not be in the actual underbrush. Yes. Uh, Or they could have just been flying differently. Yes. I had a different approach to it. Now, talking about the giant insects of the Carboniferous and Permian brings us to a little brief interlude on a subject that we keep coming back to in the podcast, which is gigantism. Yeah. Why, what makes things get huge? We did a whole episode about this, episode 144. This has come up in multiple different episodes. This is a great place to talk a little bit about the hypotheses surrounding what allowed these insects to get so big. Because a lot of big extinct things, we don't have, like we don't have sauropods anymore, mm-hmm. you know? And so there's a lot of big extinct organisms that, aren't around like giant ground sloths and stuff. We still have dragonfly shaped things today. Yeah. And some of them still get pretty big. It's, but what was happening differently to get to this big? Yes. The classic answer to this question, the the most common one you'll hear, the one that I'm sure a bunch of our listeners have already been like, oh, I know this one is oxygen. Mm -hmm. During the Carboniferous, there is evidence for particularly high levels of atmospheric oxygen forests were a new thing like trees showed up episode 73 trees happened (laughs) and filled the world with plants and plants are oxygen factories Mm -hmm. just filling the air with it so we got this spike in oxygen levels the connection here comes down to the way that insect breathing systems work yes the insect respiratory system relies on oxygen diffusing from the air into the body The higher the oxygen levels in the air, the more efficient that diffusion is going to be, which means that you are getting more fuel Mm -hmm. into the body and also that you are less dependent on respiratory tissues. So you don't have to spend as much energy and space on those particular tissues. That makes sense. There have been modern studies that have raised different insects in high or low oxygen conditions and found that some insects get smaller when raised in high oxygen some insects get bigger dragonflies are among the ones that get bigger interesting when you raise them in high oxygen atmosphere yeah and and the diffusion part basically that means they can't inhale and exhale like we can yeah it's a, it's more of a passive yeah pro- they soak it up out of the air basically also their version of blood isn't as efficient at carrying oxygen, if I understand correctly. Yeah. Now, there is another factor I saw noted with high oxygen levels. High oxygen levels in the air will also influence oxygen levels in the water. Mm -hmm. And if oxygen gets very high in the water, it can be toxic. Yes. So it's also been proposed that large bodies in aquatic bugs might help. The bigger your body, the less 
oxygen the more oxygen it's going to take to fill up the body and become toxic effectively the more massive you are the more poison it takes to kill you versus something of of similar anatomy but smaller size yes this is why you classically hear about like big people who can just drink tons of alcohol without suffering conditions while smaller people might become drunk quicker same basic concept precisely this came up when we talked about deep sea gigantism yeah, in uh, episode 128. That was one of the proposed origins for some of that, is that early oceans had toxic levels of oxygen, and that may have been a defense against that toxicity. So it's also been proposed that the there may have been a pressure for the nymphs of these ancient bugs to grow bigger, and bigger nymphs just grow into bigger adults. Yes. So it may not have been that higher oxygen levels allowed you to get bigger, but that they necessitated that you get bigger. Yeah, they forced you to get bigger to survive them. Uh, This, it has, uh, some papers have pointed out that this might line up with the fact that the lineages of ancient insects that get big tend to be the ones with aquatic larvae. Oh, and yeah. So there, there may be a connection. There may be, there's multiple ways that oxygen may have been a factor. That being said, this it, some evidence does seem to show that high oxygen levels in the past line up with when we see big insects, but not all the time. It's not a perfect correlation. There have been studies that have pointed out that sometimes this seems to be decoupled. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you will get one without the other. So it's likely that oxygen, if that is a factor, isn't the only factor. Yeah. There are other things that have been proposed. One is temperature. Yes. That we, we see lots of correlations. We talked about this in episode 144. There is a lot of correlation between climate and temperature and body size. At least one study I saw referenced found that when you look at the geologic record of oxygen levels and the size of these insects, if you correct for temperature, the oxygen correlation disappears interesting at least in at least in this one study yeah which suggests that there may it may be that there are multiple signals that make it harder for us to actually sort out what's going on that that is really intriguing that if you include other groups of data the previous patterns fade away Mm -hmm. okay it's also been pointed out that it may have just been a matter of food yep that you had complex food webs tons of plants Tons of other bugs and things that were providing an abundant food source to support big insects like this. It may have simply been that you could be big because there was enough food to grow to be the size of a giant carnivorous bug. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the trophic scale, it has also been commonly pointed out that there was nothing else in the air to hunt these bugs or compete with these bugs. Yes. There wouldn't be other flying predators until the Triassic, when gliding vertebrates start to show up, and then later you get stuff like pterosaurs. Yeah, this is definitely where my brain kept going to of. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was a time where you could be that big of a flying, uh, a predatory insect, but nowadays... That's only effective at this size because you have competition at that size. Yes. That just won't make it feasible. There's competition and also there's stuff to eat you. Yes. <laughs> in the air. Like, yeah, now you're not the the biggest, meanest flying thing around. There's other stuff that can take you down. Well, and, and depending on how they flew, if they were less maneuverable, you may not be able to dodge the attacks as well as a lot of today's dragonflies can do. Right. Now, this is another one that it isn't a perfect lineup it's not like they disappear as soon as other flying predators show <laughs> up pterosaurs show up and eat all the griffin flies right <laughs> their fossil record just ends there it is not quite as clean as that so uh, as usual there's probably multiple factors involved yep yep it's probably something very specific to uh, it could be a different thing for every lineage of ancient insects that got very big Uh, I even saw one paper that suggested that mating might be related to it. Hmm. Uh, As far as I could tell, I only saw this in one paper. I think it was like one single author paper of like, here's a hypothesis that I'm presenting that suggested that if the sort of mating habits like we see today showed up early with that mating wheel type thing, that 
you might just not have been able to fly while doing that. Yes. If you were big. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there could have been lifestyle stuff that changed that made it harder for them to maintain those sizes. So there are, as always, many hypotheses, many factors that could have contributed to these giant sizes. And as we always like to point out, you can have a mixture of them happening in different orders of if the oxygen level changes, if the temperature changes, if you get more competition for the food you're eating, if you get more things eating you, Mm -hmm. all that together could go, well, being this big of a dragonfly no longer works. Yes. And they disappear. So it could be a very complex interaction. And the reasons that these animals got big might be different than the reasons that other arthropods got big at like arthropleura the the giant millipedes that might have been getting big for different reasons yes it doesn't have aquatic larvae isn't flying around very different organisms so it could be completely different scenario the mega nurids as well as a whole bunch of their other ancient cousins that were so successful during the late paleozoic disappear as we move into the Mesozoic, and move closer to our modern lineages. There is a turnover, uh, so a replacement, old lineages disappearing, new lineages showing up, in this Permian into the Triassic transition. Now, obviously, there is a mass extinction event that happens here, the end Permian, episode 45. Exactly how hard insects were hit by that extinction, there has been conflicting studies and evidence, it's hard to tell, were did, did you suffer the same way that a lot of other things did? There are also lots of other environmental changes going on at this time. Again, once we get into the Triassic, vertebrates start gliding. Mm-hmm. So that could be putting uh, pressure on things. Whatever the various reasons, many of these ancient lineages go extinct as we move into the Triassic, including the Meganurids. They disappear around the end of the Paleozoic. But... The lineage continues to be diverse and successful. Odonata, the true, our modern order of dragonflies and damselflies, appears by the Triassic. Both Zygoptera, your damselflies, and Anisoptera, true dragonflies, appear by the late Triassic, early Jurassic. Many of our modern groups within these uh, show up in the Jurassic. There are also other extinct groups. There is an extinct group I saw mentioned a couple times, the Aeschnidiidae, which have unique wing structures. Apparently, they're noted for their very long ovipositors. Huh. That's pretty cool. These were super successful and diverse. They were a major group of extinct dragon damsel dragonflies in the Mesozoic. Then a number of these groups go extinct towards the end of the Cretaceous, including uh, the Aeschnidiidae. This is another one. How much the end Cretaceous mass extinction did this? is a little uncertain. Also, there were birds now, so that could have been a factor in it. But there are other extinct lineages that make it into the Paleogene. Uh, There are a number of extinct lineages that make it all the way into the Miocene, these ancient families as recent as 5 to 10 million years ago. Cool. By the time we get to the Pleistocene, the Ice Age... The modern diversity of damsel and dragonflies is largely established. Then they get shuffled around a bit by glaciations. <laughs> uh, there used to be dragonflies and damselflies in more northern areas like North America and Europe that during the Ice Age were kind of pushed down into the tropics where we find them today. So there is this long history of fascinating diversity within dragonflies, damselflies, and their relatives. This style of insect has been firmly established for over 300 million years. The true the, the true damselflies and true dragonflies have been around for about 200 million years. This is just a group that has kind of always been there. Yes. If you picture any terrestrial ecosystem in the last 300 million years... You are very safe to imagine dragonflies in it. Yeah, yeah. Their legacy is really almost one of a kind of just how unique their lifestyle is. You know, not just that they've been around a long time, but they've been doing a thing that is not common. Mm -hmm. And then they've been doing it well and successfully since the beginning of their, their fossil record. 
And then that fossil record goes back so much farther than you would expect for a modern group. Yeah. Well, and they, they, they're very reminiscent in that respect of sharks yes. and crocodilians where it you hit upon doing a distinctive thing, mm-hmm. a distinctive shape, and you just, you did it so well that you just kept doing that yeah. and nothing ever stopped you. No there have been, been others to... that have maybe done similar things, but that, you... You did it. No one's been able to shoulder you out the entire time. Yes. And even unlike croc, I made the comparison to crocodilomorphs, Mm -hmm. uh, crocodiliforms earlier. Crocodiliforms have like all sorts of wacky shapes and like terrestrial ones. And if you go back enough, you have the bipedal ones. This group doesn't seem to have done that. This Mm -hmm. group, I know. Nope. We are, this is, this is dragonfly. This is how you do it. We'll be different shapes and sizes a little bit, but it's, basically the same setup that we see today the whole way through yeah so cool very cool i saw a number of papers that made the important note that the fossil record of odonates and their relatives is still being investigated we are still learning tons there have been a couple of new odonate faunas identified in the last few years uh it, no i saw uh, specific examples noted in korea and china nice there was that study that i mentioned uh, i think last episode a couple episodes ago in the news about the new early dragonfly relative that hel- is helping us to understand the radiation around the end of the triassic period mm-hmm, mm-hmm. also modern dragonflies are still being learned about i was looking at The numbers that I saw cited for how many living species there are changed dramatically in papers from, like, 2010 to today. Yeah. Like, over the last decade or so, that number seems to have gone up by, like, a thousand. (laughs) Like, it's, we are still coming to understand this group of insects. And, And we're still learning so much about them, even outside of just understanding their evolution and like we study them a ton for like biomechanics yeah yeah their flight they they've got to be the most some of the most studied animals for flight biomechanics for how your wings work precisely because like having something fly like a bird would be awesome but this is kind of the peak of what the kind of flight we would love to reproduce Mm -hmm. especially for like drones and and yeah i was gonna say this is a this is a living drone yes like for you know for filming purposes or for just fun having something you know and that's what ours today are that's why they're little helicopters and not little planes Mm -hmm. because they can that gives us more options for what we can do with them but you could potentially make something that works like these and it'd be also like 10 times quieter yeah it has legs (laughs) and has you you can pick stuff up like you you could make something that would be open up doors that we potentially literally open up doors. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. They are so good at what they're doing that we have been fascinated by them for so long. Yep. So there you have it. The best insects. <laughs> I, I love them so much. They're they, so cool. They're named after dragons. Yes. Uh, and they deserve it. Well, and then they also like, you've got big, impressive wings. You've got a long, quote unquote, tail. Yep. You are predatory. You're colorful. You have a mouth full of <laughs> sword-like fangs. Yep. Like, you are very dragony. You uh, should be feared by anything that's smaller than you. They are just top to bottom impressive animals mm-hmm. they are just so impressive yeah no i love them this is i've been it's been super fun uh to get to geek out about dragonflies hey thanks to the people who requested this episode mm-hmm. topic mm-hmm. thank you for giving me this excuse i hope that you uh were i hope listen if you geeked out about the, the butt propulsion because will already knew about it so i was <laughs> robbed of that opportunity <laughs> To teach that to Will. So please uh, message us and let us know your reaction. To Feel free to record your friends reacting yes, in real yes. time and then send it to us <laughs> so that I can uh, feel uh, validated for how cool that is. Hey, before we officially wrap everything up, uh, speaking of engaging with our audience, we have patron questions. We do. One of the rewards that our supporters on Patreon can receive is the ability to submit questions for us to answer here on the podcast, contribute a little bit to the content of what we talk about. Will, what do we got? 
we've got a handful of questions that are similar in theme. Jackie asks, are most extinct species known from one or two specimens and just a few bones, or do we know most species from many complete specimens? Good question. Ryan then asks, when a new species is identified from just a few pieces, how confident can we be of reconstructing the whole rest of the body? Also a good question. And also asks, how often does it happen that two people describe a new species from just a few bones, and then it turns out they're both the same species? Great series of questions. This is a good, this is a good, feels like a good episode to answer these on. Mm -hmm. To Jackie's question, most extinct species are known from one or or bits and pieces. Yes. One or two specimens. It is fairly rare that we get a nice complete specimen. It is fairly rare that we get lots of specimens. It is very fair to say that most extinct species have been described from fragmentary scant remains. Yes, precisely. Uh, This is one of the reasons why animals like T-Rex or trilobites are so useful for uh, to us, because we do have a lot of really good specimens of them. To Ryan's question, now now that we know that, Mm -hmm. new species are described from just a few pieces all the time. Absolutely. That is extremely common. And this is a really common question is, if all you have is a tooth or a leg bone or whatever, or a wing, in the case, uh, a lot of these ancient dragonflies are known from partial wings how confident can we be in knowing what the rest of the body looks like this is one the way that i always like to put this is both not as confident as you think and also more confident than you'd think absolutely if you find the leg bone of a theropod dinosaur if you find part of the wing of a dragonfly those groups of animals basically all have the same body shape yes if you find the toe bone of a tyrannosaur It's a tyrannosaur. Mm -hmm. You know what a tyrannosaur looks like. Obviously, there may be some quirks in that individual that you're not aware of, but you know basically what the rest of that animal is going to look like. There are other cases where it'll be like, oh, we found a tooth of this weird animal and we're not. It's this extinct group of animals. We don't know a lot about that extinct group. That you would be have a really hard time reconstructing the whole body of it. Yes, precisely. Or if you find a bone that like this could be one of a number of different groups, then you're going to have a hard time reconstructing. Or if it's a group that has a lot of diversity to it, that there are a bunch of different shapes and sizes. If you find a crocodiliform tooth yep. in the Triassic, you, uh, you, you probably aren't going to be able to say what the body looked like. Yes. There's a lot of those. And, and you could be dealing with, What kind of tooth is this at what position in the mouth and Mm -hmm. things like that. So you might lose a lot of that inference. One of my favorite examples from recently, and I think we talked about this on the podcast, a couple of researchers identified a bone crushing dog over at the gray fossil site uh, last year, a couple of years ago from a single arm bone, Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. right humerus. And people have asked, they've been like, how do you know just from that arm bone, you've got a piece of art here of of this dog how do you know that yes and the answer is this we have many full specimens of this genus from around the the continent this arm bone is one of those yep unless something really weird was going on this animal is going to look like all the rest of them and then there was a bunch of cool stuff from that single arm bone that we were well okay based on the proportions of the arm bone there is a correlation between the proportions of this bone and the body So we can estimate the size and weight of it. The bone is not fully developed. So we have something about the age of the animal and the shape of your arm bones tends to correlate with hunting strategies. So we can tell something about hunting strategy, which is what I mean when I say we can tell less than you'd think because we're not able to be like, oh, it was a 12 year old female and it died on a Tuesday and it had three offspring the year before. Like that we can't tell. But we can tell you its rough size and weight, where it was in its lifespan, how it hunted. You can get a surprising amount of information sometimes from just a few bones. Well, and one phrase you use, I think, is a great way to measure it. And it's what I often say to people of like, if we find this leg of this animal from this group, unless it was doing something weird, it likely looked like this. Mm hmm. But that unless is very important. Yes. Because we have come across times in the fossil record many times where 
it turns out it was doing something weird when we find the rest of the organism and we go, whoa, yes, it didn't look at all all like what we expected its face was extremely unusual and you'll see that with a lot of like old art of certain dinosaurs Mm -hmm. where we basically just slapped a t-rex head on it you know there's lots of old art of spinosaurus where we didn't have the head and we went well it's a theropod it's got a spine or even cases where it was a reasonable reconstruct where it's like yeah it's it's a tyrannosaur Mm -hmm. or it's a whatever this is so far every one of those exactly is basically the same shape. So yeah, this one probably was. And then we find more of it later and go, oh, hey, this was the exception. This, this was, was the weird one. This was the eye eye of, <laughs> of dino- like, And so that's why we can't say, well, the rest of it looked like this. The rest of it likely looked like this unless it was doing something weird. Yes. And that that's the way I always like phrasing it. And that's my favorite way to explain it. Based on all the information we got off of what we have and off of all of its relatives, most likely we're dealing with something. The rest of it's probably going to be in this general category, unless it was one of the weirdos doing something unique. Yes. And then to Ryan's other question, how often does it happen that two people describe new species from just a few bones and then it turns out that they're the same species? Uh, pretty often. Yep. That ha- not like no, it's not like a daily occurrence. No. But that does happen. One of the most famous examples of something like that is Anomalocaris. Yes. Anomalocaris, the weird. Speaking of top predators in this episode, uh, Cambrian aquatic lobstery thing with the face appendages was originally the mouth parts, the appendages, and the body were all found separately. And all identified as different animals. Mm -hmm. And then later we found a more complete one and went, oh, those are all part of the same thing. Yeah, because we'd never seen anything like it before. So we didn't have any indication of, well, this sure does look like there should be a whole bunch of other animal to go with this. We didn't know. Uh, I can't off the top of my head. I don't have a good example of things that were named from fragmentary remains that then turned out to be the same. Often paleontologists won't name something if it is sort of an unclear fragmentary remain, sometimes the part that is the part you would use for that is the only part. Yep. So like teeth, yeah. An ancient mammal might not be named from a tooth and then also a hip bones or something. Because you wouldn't like, name the species off the hip bones. Right. So it's not as common uh, as it could be. Almost certainly more common earlier in paleontology where there was less information there was less that knowledge being shared uh the situation that ryan is describing in the question is what happened to brontosaurus and apatosaurus and they were named off of mostly complete skeletons yes look that was mostly complete skeletons that were given two different names and then later reassessed as uh likely the same genus and you'll hear some stuff like this happening before publishing where like at conferences A paleontologist will present on, this is the study we're currently working on where we're going to name this new species. And then after the talk, someone in the audience goes, hey, could I get a closer look? Yep. (laughs) Because that sure does look a lot like the new species I was about to name. Are you looking for a co-author? Yep. And so a lot of times it'll shake out before it ever makes it to paper Mm -hmm. with paleontologists communicating. And nowadays the intercommunication among paleontologists is better than it was. Yes. So you're more likely to catch when it's like, well... They said they were also looking at this recently, and now that I'm looking at this specimen, it's sounding kind of similar. So let me shoot them an email real quick and just say, could you send a picture over? Because I think we might have the same thing. (laughs) I feel like it's more common for two things to be named as separate and then later be reassessed. Yes, exactly. As the same thing, then I feel like it's less, it's, it's. Not nearly as common as you'd think that something is described from two different parts of the body, mm-hmm. and then it turns out to be the same thing. And and sometimes that can just be a like if we we both named you know the same you know, shell, so it's basically the same exact mm-hmm. stuff, but you were at a different region, or I was naming a different size, and so they were different enough at a glance that I did not see that those were the same until later on. Someone looks at them all together at once. And go, no, those are just younger or a slightly different morphotype. But really, the statistics does not shake out that they should be separate. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you don't happen to see or you don't have access to, if we're doing the research at similar times and I don't have access to that collection. 
we could just end up naming them and then someone else goes no and they they got in a month before you did right <laughs> so their name <laughs> sticks so it definitely happens uh, stuff like that has happened again anomalocaris is sort of the yeah. classic yep. example of that uh it happens with plants oh yeah as well uh different parts of plants are kind of traditionally given different names because they're kind the, of like trace fossils where you can't always assign them back to the parent yes, plant like the leaf the root the trunk will be given different names so all great questions all really sort of foundational questions uh in paleontology uh so to sum up uh jackie most extinct species are known from just fragmentary remains uh ryan we can be pretty confident most of the time when we assert we're being confident from just a few pieces and also yeah sometimes we do that yep sometimes uh things get named multiple times and this is why re-examination and reassessments <laughs> and reviews are so important thank you for those questions thank you for your support on patreon thank you to all of our patrons uh, who help us to do our science communication here on the podcast and all of our fun podcast stuff thank you out there to all of our listeners thank you to all of our requesters thank you to all of our future patrons eh? <laughs> now is a great time if you're interested to become a patron because our patron giveaway we're celebrating 500 patrons that we hit in the summer by doing a giveaway it's going to happen during our seven year live stream at the end of january and to be eligible to win some cool prizes all the goodies that you can get on patreon you have to be an active patron by the very end of the year and this episode if you're listening to this when it comes out there's that's a week away yes so now's a great time to join the patreon if you would like to and to support us and the things that we're doing also happening at the end of the year is our end of the year q a keep your ears out for that don't forget that every episode of the podcast has a blog post on our website. There is a link in the episode description. You can go check that out. There'll be pictures and links and stuff to our news and more information if you want to dive deeper into dragonflies. Thanks again to all of our listeners, our re requesters, our supporters, our patrons. Extra special thanks to our top tier patrons, Sarah May, Danielle the Bug Lover, and Robert Mart. We thoroughly appreciate your support. We release episodes every fortnight. This is the last episode of 2023. Yep, yep. This is it. Episode 182 will come out uh, next year. And this, is, this has been a fun one to end on. Yes. Uh, this has been a holiday present to myself. I was about to say, this is a good <laughs> one as a gift for the holiday season. Uh, hopefully everybody else enjoyed it too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do episodes and a little part of me is like, I don't care. If anyone else enjoys this. Oh, yeah. Nope. This one's for me. Yep. Uh, fortunately, this is a very cool topic, and I'm sure that people will en have enjoyed learning about dragonflies and stuff. Well, would, but this, the, I was like, no, I, this, I'm, I'm having a good time. As the quote you said <laughs> at the, the beginning of the discussion, it's like, this is one of the most beloved insects in human history. Yes. Like, and throughout human culture. Everyone we, likes dragonflies. We love them. If you don't like dragonflies, I was uh, say, write in, let us know. Somewhere there's a Grinch right now that's like, I hate dragonflies there's somebody, the whole there's dragonfly <laughs> season. <laughs> Every year, it starts weeks early, it starts as soon as Thanksgiving's over. Dragonflies, they're all over the stores. You can't escape them. The radios, it's all dragonfly music. Uh, hey, everybody, have a happy new year. Uh, those of you who are celebrating our end of December mm -hmm. with New Year shenanigans, uh, we hope that you're enjoying your holiday season. If you have holidays to be enjoying, Precisely. Uh, hey, we'll be back next year. Yep. 2024, uh, we're going to do uh, other stuff. Pro mostly the same stuff. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's going to be most of the same because we are uh, creatures of habit. We are also extremely consistent like dragonflies. That's right. With 300 million years from now, yeah. they're going to look back and be like, wow, they were doing the same those same jokes. Almost the, the, seven down. The same. <laughs> seven down. 299,993,000 uh, to go. We are well on our way. Hey, join us uh, next for uh, year number eight. <laughs> We're going to get there together. It's going to be good. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. 
You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.